Yes, please. Okay, please. We are going to start normal labor. Yes. Those of you making noise, try to stop it. Okay, so we are going to talk about normal labor. I think uh, we started with the definition and then we got to a lot of points. So I just want one of you to give us a summary of what we did last week. If you are coming to give me the summary, please, I want to know your name. I want to know your name. Yes, Christian Addison. Christy? Christian Addison. Yes, go ahead. Okay, Christy, go ahead week, with what you remember. Mm -hmm. Okay, please. Last week, we started with labor, and we said that labor is the process whereby the product of conception is being expelled through the bed canal. And we also went on with what normal labor is. And I remember sister said that normal labor is the process whereby the breast is carried to term. Fetus is presenting with the vertex and is born within the period of 15 to 18 hours. Born per the vagina with no complications to the mother nor the baby. And we also talked about the first days of labor. And I remember that said that the, the onset of painful, regular uterine rhythmic contraction, thinning of the cervix to full dilatation, to full dilatation. And sister also made mention of the duration of labor be, being varied from individuals. And later she threw a question to ask that, why should a midwife be worried concerning a client who had joined us and anemia? And the answer was that the midwife should be worried because joiners and anemia can cause severe PPH and therefore it needs to be managed before the onset of labor. And we went on with assessments done during VE. Please, this is all that I remember. Thank you. Uh, Christy, let's all clap for her. She has done very well. Please clap for her. She has done very well. She has done very well. Thank you very much for that summary of last week's uh, learning proceedings. Okay. So, uh, we are going to continue with the physiology of first stage of labor, then we come to mechanism of labor before we manage the second stage of labor. Please, Rhoda, sorry, I can see your hand up. How may I help you? Rhoda, sorry. Yes, sister. How may I, I help to, you? I was about to talk about what we learned last week. I oh, think okay. My he has oh, said it all. Okay. Yes, Thank you very much. So we are going yeah. to see the physiological changes. Please, those making noise. What do you think I can do to them? Should I put them in the waiting room? There is, yes, yes, yeah. Please mute yes, your mic. Ma yes, ma'am. <laughs> Should I? Should I leave them in the waiting room so that we, I, I think I've said this the second time. People think you still need to add up. Okay. So I'm continuing. If they, anybody should bring herself or himself again, then I will know where to place the person. Okay. So we are going to see the physiology, physiological changes that will take place in the woman during the first stage of labor. Okay. Please, anybody with an idea of the physiological changes. It can be the last physiological changes. Don't worry. Say it and explain to us. If you have forgotten all the physiological changes, it shouldn't be contraction and retraction. That one you should know. So we are going to see how to uh, link these things to the actual labor that is pending. So what is the physiological changes? What are they? What are these physiological changes that will take place for a woman before finally, finally, she's compelled to push the baby out? Yes. Christy, your hand is still up or is a new hand raised? Yes, Christina Addison. 
Oh, Bridget. Bri okay, let's see. Bridget, Bridget Kudom. Tell us something. Bridget. Um, sister, sister, please, the Fandal dominance. Good. List them. You list them. Everybody. I should list them. all. Oh, you can list all. Oh, you okay. Uh, so we have list. the Fandal dominance. Then we I remember um polarity. Um then we have the what you just said, contraction and retraction. <laughs> Please, that's all I remember. Polarity. <laughs> okay, that's good. Yeah, let's go. To, let's hear from others too. Belinda. Um, sister, please. Belinda, we hello. Also... Senya? Yes. Belinda. Yes, sister. sister. Go ahead. Please, we also have the formation of the upper and the lower uterine segments. Okay. Then we also have the retraction <laughs> ring. Hello. Hello, please. I can hear you. Yeah, I you said the formation. The... Formation of the upper and the lower uterine segment. The retraction ring and cervical effacement. Do you know what I'm saying? I'm not sure what I'm saying. I'm not sure what I'm saying. I'm not sure what I'm saying. No, keep quiet and please. I don't know where I'm going. Is in here, so you don't worry, don't worry at all. Is it not Francisca Ochre who is making that noise? No, you should come again. She should Hello, come sister. again with that noise. Yes, sister. Please, yes. there is also the presence of show. Okay. I said there is also the presence of show, presence of show. and dilatation of the service. The service. Good. Any other? So Sister. now what we have listed. Yes, dear. Um, please, yes. there, is, there mm -hmm. is formation of four waters, rupture mm -hmm. of membranes, mm -hmm. general fluid pressure, and fetal axis pressure. Great. Thank you very much. Now, I want you people to pick one of the Physiological changes during the first stage of labor. Just pick one. You pick one, and then you explain it to our understanding. So that's the physiology of first stage of labor. Pick one, just one physiology, and explain it to. You. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Francisca Ochre. Sister. Go ahead. Uh, sister, please. Uh, with the um, cervical dilatation, mm -hmm. is the process of enlargement of the external os, uh, mm -hmm. whereby it is tightly closed aperture of an opening. Um, mm -hmm. That's a, um, whereby the effacement has taken place and it's um, in form in alignment with the outer and the opening uh, orifice of the service. That's, it, it's forming a line with the uterus. And when you do a V, the, uh, the centimeters or the dilatation should be 10 centimeters. That's the cervical dilatation. Okay. I'll come back to you. Go over. You have the text, but go over. Organize yourself well. And then I want you to explain that one. So what you said is true, but it wasn't consistent. Okay. Okay. So uh, mm, so go through and then come back again. Then okay, Elizabeth Sapon. Good. Elizabeth Sapon. Elizabeth Sapon, mention one physiological change during the first stage of labor and explain it. Please. I'm talking about the fundal dominance. Mm -hmm. Please, the word dominance means it, it, it becomes more intense or it's plenty. And with this, mm -hmm. we talk about the contractions. This means that the contraction dominates. It becomes more intensive in the uterus, mm -hmm. especially at the fundus. 
then it's pressed mm -hmm. to the corner of the uterus, then within the cavity, then it extends downwards to become mm -hmm. more intense. Okay. Then uh, it, it, it becomes irregular. It's on and off, okay. lasting for some time, and it helps with the expulsion of the fetus. Good. Okay. But then uh, with the fundal dominance, with the contraction as you're talking about, I'm just adding to it. The contractions actually start from one part of the cornua, then it spreads over the fundus to the other side of the cornua. Okay. Probably as the name implies that fundal dominance. So people think the contraction starts from the fundus, but actually it is starting from one aspect of the cornua, then it passes over the fundus, get to the other side of the cornua before the entire uterus responds to the contractions and then the contraction becomes so intense. That is, that is how it, it works. Good. Okay. Yes, okay. who else? Thank you. Uh, is that Elizabeth okay. Sapon? Thank you. Yes. Okay. Thank you okay. for that explanation. Okay. Now, Beta Essien. Beta Essien. Yeah, yes, sister. Hello. Uh, pick one. Yeah. The one I will pick is the Hello, I can hear you, please. Mm. The one I will pick is the information of upper and lower uterine segments. Is the formation of upper and lower uterine segments. Mm -hmm. Before two to three months of labor, mm -hmm. the upper and the lower segments separated and they are formed by the end of the pregnancy. Mm -hmm. And the upper devolve from the fundus. And the lower mm -hmm. segments also form from the isthmus and the cervix. Good. Okay. Good. That is the formation of our upper and lower uterine segment. Because the essence of this formation is that once the upper uterine segment is formed, it is going to act as a pistol, you know, to push the baby down. Whereas the lower uterine segment, as she rightly said, which is formed by the cervix and then the isthmus who also try to contract and dilate and dilate so that at the end of the day the fetus can pass through the vagina to come out good yes any other yes sister yeah go ahead Rhoda. i want to talk about the polarity okay say it the, the polarity describes the harmony that prevails between the two poles or the segment mm -hmm. of the uterus throughout the labor. Mm -hmm. And what happens is that during each uterine contraction, the two poles will act harmoniously. And then mm -hmm. the upper pole will contract strongly and then retract to expel the fetus. Mm -hmm. Then the lower pole also contracts and dilates Re to allow the expulsion to take place. Good. Very good. I think this one is straightforward. Polarity, there's a harmony, understanding between the upper and lower uterine segment. So that if the upper uterine segment is trying to contract strongly, acting like a pistol and trying to push the baby down to the lower uterine segment, because there's harmony between these two poles, what happens is that the lower uterine segment will also respond by contracting and dilating it will contract and open up so that the upper uterine segment will be able to push the baby down to the lower uterine segment. That is how come that we are saying that there's a, a, a harmony between the two of them. So the neural harmony that we are seeing is as a result of the, the first person, I mean, it's as a result of the Upper uterine segments contracting well, the lower uterine segments also contracting, but then paving way for the uh, for the fetus to come out. Good. Yes, Georgina Kagua. The name didn't appear well. Georgina Kagua. Uh -huh. I, I can see her. Yeah, I can see your hand up. Um, to talk on the cervical dilatation. Cervical dilatation, good. Go ahead. Yeah. Yes. The cervical, uh, the, the service has a, uh, and I'm talking on the cervical dilatation. The cervical canal yes. during the 
lower segments. And in uh, newly virus, in, no, in newly virus uh, women, the dilatation, uh, sorry, man. Uh, in newly virus women, uh, the assessment is completed before dilatation starts. By in virus women, the dilatation occurs at the same time. Very good. Well done. Okay. I can still see uh, Fadila, Fadila Mohammed. I can see your hand up. Let's hear you. Fadila, because yes, you are numerous Major. and I think we have to go through them. Yes. Please, I want to talk on the show. The show? The show okay. Yes, please. It's one of the cardinal signs of labor. So the, when during pregnancy, the external host forms a plaque. So when the woman gets into labor, starts labor, is the onset of labor, it's ruptures and come. That's what we see a brownish discharge, which shouldn't be bright red as in blood. So it's a sign that labor has started. So it comes accompanied with the uterine contractions, which will now enable the cervical dilatation to take her. Thank you. That's uh -huh. my idea. So is the cervical dilatation, the, the surface is holding onto the operculum, the mucus plug, blocking the cervical canal, preventing ascension of in infection. And so once the cervix starts to efface, when the cervix starts to take up, what happens is that the, the plug, that operculum that is plugging the cervical canal will then, then dislodge because it is attaching itself to the inner wall of the cervix. But now cervix is taking up, it's dilating. Yeah. There's no, no, it doesn't have any firm attachment, so it will dislodge. Now, when it is before it dislodges, there will be tiny, tiny blood vessels or capillaries that will also end up rupturing, and then they will be bleeding gradually. It will mix up with the puculum and come out as the show that you are describing. Thank you very much. Okay, mm -hmm. so now let's see. Thank you. So now let's see. We are talking about, we are talking about. Uh, physiology of first stage of labor. Is there anything that is left that we didn't talk about or all along we did not understand but we couldn't get a chance to ask? Is there anything like that? Hello, sister. Yes, dear. Um, please about the effacement. Um, I learned we have in percentage. Sometimes when they are writing, you write thirty percent effacement, forty percent effacement. I want to you to clarify that side for me. Thank you. Oh, it's not it's not any big deal. If they say it is forty percent effacement, meaning that in the first place, let me clarify the word effacement. With effacement, what happens is that. The the neural mus the, the muscles, mm, the nerves and the muscles around the cervical os, especially this the internal cervical os. Muscles around there will start and the nerve there will start to contract. And once it contracts, it causes dilatation of the internal os and part of the cervical canal. Take it. I say when we say effacement the internal cervical also is going to dilate. Then part of the cervical canal, the cervical canal that is fusiform in shape, when we start the anatomy, you know, it will, it will, part of it will dilate. So you will get something like a full nail, a full nail that we use to, you know, fail something. That is how the cervical canal will behave. So that when you do vagina examination, if the surface has a phase, you realize that you feel the external os, external cervical os at that time has become soft. So you can feel it. But your hand cannot enter fully into the, the cervical canal to make any assessment. So then you will say that depending on the length, the length of the cervical canal dilatation, then you call for 
either it has 80 percent because sometimes you put your hand there and it's like three quarter of it is opened up leaving just a quarter that is where we are 80 percent and 85 percent in but when you put your hand there and the cervical horse is like a uh, Nobody should say anything. I'm just telling you. Okay. So, so it's like part of the cervical canal is opened up. So when you do V, depending on the consistency of the service and how well the external cervical is, is dilated, that will give you the percentage that we are talking about. For example, maybe there's a full or complete effacement of the service. You put your hand there and your hand can even enter the cervical os, probably admitting two fingers. Of course, depending on the parity of the woman. If she's a grand multiparous woman, remember her service, the external cervical os is a slit like a picture. Somebody mentioned it when she was describing something. I heard it. I heard it, the slit like a picture. Slit -like, the slit like a picture is the, the, the way the cervical os looks like and feels in a multiparous woman. But if she's a primigraphic duck, her service will be pinhole. She's a more she's a primigraphic duck. She's pregnant for the first time. Then her service will have what you call a pinhole service. So take note. After the multiparous woman, whether she's pregnant or not, the cervical os, which is little like a picture, was, is consistent. It's always like that. It is always like that. The slit like a picture is a transverse opening of the cervical os. But if it, it opens like it is inside the, how do you call it? It is round. It's like, it's like a picture is transverse in appearance. But the pinhole service that we are talking about, it is service is around. That is the difference. And effacement is what I've explained to you. So that if there's effacement, that is how you feel the service. If effacement has not taken place, sometimes you'll be looking for the external cervical us to enter to assess cervical that is, but you can't find it. It's like the service has hidden itself. You try to be looking for it and you can't even find the service. Effacement doesn't take place. If effacement takes place, you'll be able to do some work at the test. Okay, thank you, sister. You're welcome, madam. Please, any other to finish? There are, we are left with three points to be mentioned. Julie? Juliana Darko, go ahead. Go ahead, Julie. Pick one and explain. It's left with formation of back of forward test. Somebody should explain that, please. We are doing participatory learning in terms of labor. So that is how it goes. So I'm waiting for you. Hello. Hello. Yeah. The formation of a, uh, I would like to take that one. The formation of what test? Hello. Hello. Please, I can hear you. Go ahead. Yes, please. Uh, the, the formation of what test occurs when, when the baby moves down to the pelvis. The, a uh, amniotic fluid, will, some will be in front of the baby's head, all the four water, the four waters, and then the rest will be uh, will be left behind the baby's the baby body, which is called the hind waters. That's what I know about the formation of waters. Okay. Any other clarification? Okay. So now, once... like... yes. The uh, upper again. and the lower uterine segment. The formation mm -hmm. of upper and lower uterine segment. Mm -hmm. Hello, sister. Yes. 
please with the upper and the lower uterine segment anatomically we have the upper and the lower part so the upper uterine segment is formed from the body of the fundus and it is mainly concerned with the contraction and the retraction of it and it is normally the thick and the muscular parts and with the lower uterine segment it's formed from the isthmus and the cervix hello oh. sister and it is prepared it. the stension and the it, <laughs> please take your time and let's digest this you said it is it is formed from where Hello. Sister, please, with the upper parts, it's from okay. the body of uh, sister. Please, I said with the upper uterine segment, mm -hmm. it's from the upper, um, it's from the body of the fundus. Hello, sister. Hello, please, I'm listening to you. I'm with you. Yeah, and the, lower, you. and the lower and the lower uterine segment is formed from the isthmus and the cervix. Both that one, there's no two ways about it. That is true. So, okay. on this note, thank you very much. Okay. On this note, please, ladies and gentlemen, we have now known the physiology. Is there something left for people to add? Josephine, Josephine Opoku, yes, let's hear you. Josephine Opoku, we are we hand this up, sister. Please, about the restoration. Uh -huh. Okay, so the retraction ring um, is a ridge between the upper and the lower uterine segment. So the retraction ring, it rises as the upper uterine segment contracts, and then it retracts as the lower uterine segment tends out to accommodate the uterus. So once the surface is fully dilated, the fetus can okay. now leave the uterus. That's a retraction ring. Oh. What is the difference between retraction ring and constriction ring? For students, send you put question there and they are answering the opposite way. Let's clarify this. What is the difference between retraction ring and constriction ring? Hello, Mama. Hello, dear. Go ahead. Please, the... Uh... Retraction ring. The uh, retraction ring is you. Is, you can't see it uh, 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 physically, or is it? You cannot see it on the abdomen. But the bundles ring, you see it abdominally. That is when there is an eminence, uh, uh, eminence of uterine rupture. Okay, that is good. I'll take that. Thank you very much. Yes. Okay. So now we have. Oh, Sister, please, I have... also want to add something. Okay, okay, add. Go ahead. Please, mm -hmm. I want to add um, the fetal as is pressure. Pressure. We left out one, yeah. Um, with that one, as the fundus contracts, the pressure is transmitted to the lower uterine segment and mm -hmm. it's transmitted along the, uh, the long axis of the fetus to the mm -hmm. lower uterine segment. So any lie apart from the longitudinal, um cervical dilatation is not effective. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay. So Hello, Mama. yes, yeah. Please uh, the yes. uh four waters and the hind water. Uh -huh. Yes, Mama. The four waters and the hind water. I'm a bit confused because uh, uh the, the way the lady explained it, I didn't get it. How did you understand it? <laughs> oh, say it. Like, mm -hmm. It's like the 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 four the four waters when there is contraction then a uh, uh, contraction when the uh, the uterus contracts and relax uh, contracts there is a water that is behind the uterus no? that's the four waters it's rushes to the fetal head to prevent fetal uh, head injury. So when the woman is after uh, during labor, the four water ra uh, ruptures, then the hand water will also push the baby out. So that's what I'm, but the way she was explaining, I didn't get it well. Okay. 
In this case, let me quickly brief you on how the hind waters and the bag of four waters fall. What happens with that? I can't even see the child where the noise is coming from. So what actually happens is that during contractions, initially, the baby is in the back of four waters. Of course, if the membranes have not ruptured. But then as the fetus is descending, as the fetus descends and with contraction, the fluid that surrounds the fetus, you know, membranes have not ruptured. So the fluid that surrounds the fetal, the amniotic fluid, some of this amniotic fluid will pass along, especially when there's ill fitting presenting part. When there's ill fitting presenting part, that's what you clearly. So what happens is that some of the fluid that is surrounding the fetal will seep alongside. Will seep alongside. If you can, if there's if you are in two or there's somebody closer to you, make the pelvic outlet. Just Please, who is there? Why? Why? Huh? Sorry, somebody was knocking at my door. Okay, so I'm saying that the fluid that is surrounding the fetus, when the fetus is descending and there hasn't been a, a, a situation where the, the service is not fitting snugly to the presenting part, then there's that kind of spaces between the presenting part, between the presenting part and then the, the, the service. So the fluid that surrounds the fetus, some of the fluid will sit alongside where there are spaces to come and fill the, the presenting part, the front part of the presenting part. Some of the fluid will fill there. Now, as it fills there, and then this thing continues, the head now, the fetal head is now coming to fit snugly to the service, sealing the fluid that is uh, sipping alongside, filling the fluid that is sipping alongside to come and fill the, the front part of the presenting part. So that once that, that canal or that space is, is occupied, by the presenting part fitting well to the service, then the drainage ceases. So that the fluid that came in front at first becomes the bag of uh, four waters. And now because the service and the head is fitting snugly, there's no more fluid seeping alongside, then the fluid, the remaining fluid that surrounds the fetus becomes the bag of hind waters. Please, do you understand? The one who asked the question. Yeah. Is it clear to you? No, sister. Yes, yes ma'am. Yes, okay. sister. Please, who, whoever, if you do understand it, explain it to her. Somebody said no. If you are feeling sleepy and you don't get up, then you will never so, understand it. Mama is Hello. saying um, that. Hadja. Hadja, uh -huh. yes, you are saying that. So we are in the No, the one explaining that. answer. Let her answer, please. Is it Bridget Kudam on the line? Yes. It's Habiba. Yes, Habiba. Habiba. Habiba, explain what you are. Habiba Fatao. Explain what you are explaining and let's hear you. Yes, Mama. Mama was saying that when there is contraction, there, when there is contraction, there is a Fluid does a, a bag of water, it leaks into the uh, same part. That is where the four waters uh, uh, forms. Oh, Mama, that's not what you're saying. 
And uh, what I was trying to say is that uh, that just picture that the whole body, yes. the baby. Uh, yes. And Magia, please, can I try? Yeah, try and let's see. Okay. So, uh, with how I, I understood it, I wanted to. Hadji, I wanted to say that before the fetal head attaches firmly to the service, whilst membranes is still intact, that water, that water, no, that light corner, that one is the four water. Then when it ruptures or when there is rupturing and the baby's head now feels the cervical dilatation, not allowing any lycor to leak out. No. That water remaining inside the uterus now becomes the hand water. So when you push the baby out, I won't say so Kakrabi will come later. If exactly. if I'm not wrong, Hadja, is that what he said? That is exactly what I'm trying to say. That is exactly what I'm trying to say. The fluid that surrounds the baby is going to divide it into two okay. compartments. When the service the head has not um fixed well to the service, if it doesn't that, then fluid will be oozing alongside. And then it will come and fill the front part of the membrane. But as soon as the fetus descend and the head fits snugly to the when it fits snugly to the service, when it fits snugly to the service, then the fluid, the remaining fluid that surrounds the rest of the body of the baby becomes the bag of hind waters. So the water filled in front of the presenting part initially before the snuggling of the of the of the service by the presenting part now becomes the bag of four waters. Then the one surrounding the fetus becomes the bag of hind waters, as simple as that. So normally it is the bag of four waters that the midwife will use the amion hook to rapture. And we are saying that even with this membrane, labor, if we are saying conserve the membrane, never attempt to rupture these membranes. The membranes can only be ruptured during the second stage of labor. Conserve the membrane as much as you can, because look at the physiology that we are talking about. If the membranes is there and the bag of water is there, it helps with cervical dilatation. But you only rush to rupture the membranes only to introduce infection to the poor patient. So you have been rushing to conduct a how do you call it? Rapture membranes. Try to desist from that. You are not degree midwives. So behave as such. To some, I'm not talking about all of you, but some of us, some of us, that's how we behave. As soon as the patient comes, they want to rapture membrane. Thinking that the patient will deliver earlier than time. It's never true. So that is it. Yes, whose hand is up? The one whose hand is up, please, we can go ahead and talk. Hello, Hadia. Hello, Hadia. Hello. Yes. Please, so I just want to. Yes, I just want to demonstrate something for her to remember. She okay, so Ahima, of Ferua, go ahead. Uh -huh. She used a balloon for her. Yes, you go. 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 Yes. Hello. Hello, yeah, okay. Ahima, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead, Ahima. So when you get a balloon, you throw your, 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 your and then you tie the end of the balloon, but you just beat as a loose a bit, and then just uh, hold in between the balloon. So you holding it is the uh, like is signing a signal as a baby head, and then mm -hmm. when you tie it to tie the the end, you tie it tidy, and then you just push mm -hmm. some of the air into the, the end part of the where you have tied, and then you leave the bigger part mm -hmm. as the baby body. That is where the formation goes on. So you see that the, the, the end part where you tied, the small part that uh, is around with the air, imagine that is amniotic fluid, that is the four water. And then the remaining parts that you just hold there, where your hands is, becomes the four water. That's the behind one, the one that is surrounding the baby bottle. That is where you can use it to demonstrate in case you don't get the scenario that they are talking about. So thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. I think that is clear enough. It is clear enough. So please, let's move on. Himakushia, thank you very much. 
Shall we move on, please? So we are talking about physiology of first stage of labor. Now, with this physiology in mind, we didn't talk about development of retraction ring. We didn't mention that the development of retraction ring is a, a it's, it's like a demarcation line developing between the upper and lower uterine segment. It's physiological change that is going on. on. But this physiological ring, this development of the retraction ring is physiological. But at a point in time, if it becomes excessively extend or stretched, then it will be associated with severe uterine contraction. And that's where this retraction ring, which is invisible, visible, it is seen like a, a taut or ring or rope that can be seen between the uh, under the umbilicus and then the symphysis pubis. You see it like a, a taut rope under the umbilicus, between the umbilicus and the symphysis pubis. And at, at that time, it is a warning sign telling you the midwife that if you don't open up to deliver this baby, they trust, I'm going to rapture. So it's a warning sign telling the midwife that if something is not done to deliver the baby immediately, the woman's uterus is going to rapture. So we call that, at that time, it attains the name, what? Bundles ring. At that time, it attains the name Bundles ring. But initially, it was a retraction ring. This retraction ring is different from constriction ring. Constriction ring is abnormal uh, contraction of muscle fibers surrounding and tightening the baby's either the baby's neck or leg. And if it can happen in first, second, and third stage of labor, that is the constriction ring. And it can, it is one of the major causes of retained placenta. Spasms of the circular muscle fibers that can occur around the, the any longitudinal aspect of the baby, be it the arm, the leg, the neck. And if it happens in the third stage of labor, then we will we'll call it our glass constriction. Our glass constriction. Please take note of all these things so that what these are the questions are objective. So take note of it. So it's different from this retraction ring. Please, that sister, can you explain that place again? Adja, please, can Which you one? go over for us, please? The retraction ring and the constriction ring. Okay. I'm saying that the retraction ring, it is a physiological ring that develops. It behaves like a demarcation line between the upper and lower uterine segment. It's physiologically, it is developing. It is there during the first stage of labor. Hence, we say it's one of the physiological changes during first stage of labor. Are you getting it? Now, the constriction ring is, however, a different phenomenon altogether. The constriction ring, I'm saying, that one, it, it can occur during first stage, second stage, or third stage of labor. But the constriction, the retraction ring occurs only in the first stage of labor. But the constriction ring can occur during first, second, or third stages of labor. And what happens is that in constriction ring, there is spasms. Spasms of the circular muscle fibers of the uterus, molding round, it will mold round any longitudinal aspects. In fact, it's abnormal midwifery, but I'm teaching you normal labor in a way. But because it has come out, that's why I'm taking my time to explain to you. So it will just mold round any lengthy part of the baby. Where lengthy part is the, the, the arm of the baby, the legs of the baby, the neck of the baby. And I'm saying that when it happens during the third stage of labor, where the spasms will mold around the placenta, the placenta that we are making an attempt to deliver, sometimes you get retained placenta, you don't understand. Ah, but the fetal part of the placenta is, so, is already showing, it's almost out. But the rest of the placenta is not coming out. Why? Because there has been 
construction ring formation. The circular muscle fibers of the uterus has molded around part of the placenta and it's retaining it. It's holding on to it tightly. And so it won't come out. And I'm saying at that time, we call it our glass constriction. If you have heard it before, that is the our glass constriction. When constriction ring most around the placenta during the test stage of labor. I hope it's clear. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. I'm, ask, I'm asking you. Yes, Adria. Yes, yes Adria. We are there. Okay. Yes, so, do you, yes, yes, okay. do you understand it? Yes, we are in. Yes. Okay. Do you understand it now? Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. okay. So that yes. is it. That is it. Okay. So now we are done with the physiology of first stage of labor. Any question? We talked about polarity, where there's neuromuscular harmony between the upper and lower uterine segment. So we talk about contraction and retraction of the uterine muscles, where the upper uterine segment will contract strongly, act like a pistol, which the fetus down, and then the lower uterine segment will contract and then dilate. Please take note of that. The upper uterine segment contract, contracting and then um, and retracting, where retraction means it contracts and retains some of the contractibility so that the next contraction will start from there. That's what we mean by contraction and retraction. But then the lower uterine segment, if there's understanding between the upper and lower uterine segment, then the lower uterine segment will contract and dilate to allow the, the fetus to come down. Then we are say, also saying that there should be a, a we are talking about polarity. We have spoken about contraction and retraction. Development of retraction rig, I've explained it. Then formation of bag of four waters. Four waters and hind waters. We have for, I've also explained that one. And then a uh, rapture of membranes. The membranes will rapture at, at the end of it all. Now, before the membranes rapture, there will be uh, the, the, the appearance of show where the tenacious mucus, that is the operculum, will dislodge, it will come out. And then as the cervix is dilating with contraction, some of the tiny, tiny blood vessels around the cervix will also rupture and it will mix up with the operculum and come out as show. Then finally, there will be rupture of membranes. I, uh, how do you call it? Like this fluid pressure where the, the Amniotic fluid will act as a, a shock absorber so that when the membranes are intact, the, the, the contraction will be exerted on the, onto the, the amniotic fluid so that the amniotic fluid will just bounce back without having direct impact on the fetus. It is only perfect when the membranes have not ruptured. But if the membranes rupture, then there's direct pressure from the contraction onto the fetus. So those of you who want to try it, don't try it, but it, because it's not the best in any way. You can feel it, you can test it like, uh, when the membranes rupture and there's contraction, feel the feta, check the feta heartbeat. You check it, whether it is time or not, check it. You see there's irregularity. The effect becomes so irregular. Why? Because the membranes have ruptured. And so the fluid that was acting as a shock absorber is no more. And finally, there, there's the pressure from the contraction onto the fetus. And so fetus becomes a little bit uh, hypoxic. So when you go, those of you in the labor world, you give it, go and try it. As soon as the woman gets contraction and it's over, listen to the FH. Either it is too hard, it, there's irregularity in it. It becomes so irregular because the fetus is becoming hypoxic. Okay. So then I think we are done with the contraction and retraction of the uterine muscles or the physiology of first stage of labor. Madam. Adia. Madam. Please, I'm yes, also madam. thinking that maybe, hello, uh, rupture hello. of the membranes earlier before the second stage of Hello. Hello, I'm listening. Before Everybody the is listening. Of, uh, labor, if you rupture them, okay. 
after uh, when you rapture it early stage, I'm also thinking that there can be any injuries to the head because that's all water help us as uh, shock absorbers. So as contractions is progressing, head can also be hitting into maybe surrounding uh, uh, bones, which can also uh, the, the head. Yeah, it depends on the Thank level you. at which the service. I mean, the head has descended. But the shock absorber, it is not the head that is receiving the shock absorber. It is the amniotic fluid itself. Because the fluid, the contraction will bounce onto the amniotic fluid. So if it is no more, that's why there's direct pressure from the contraction on the baby. Okay. That's it. Um, Thank yes. You. Okay, you're welcome. So that is it. Now let's see. What are the... Uh, The signs of first stage of labor. And how do you manage the first stage of labor? What are the signs of first stage of labor? You to know that she's in the first stage of labor. Yes, uh, Viviana Santi. Yeah, please, sorry for taking it, but uh, fetal as this pressure was mentioned, but uh, the explanation didn't go off. I, I really didn't get the explanation of the fetal as this pressure. Oh, the fetal as this, the fetal as this pressure. Hello, hi, yeah. Hey. Uh, Hadia. Our wires, please, please. Our wires are. Please wait. Wait, I'm going outside. Our wires are cracking and it's making, yeah. it's creating fire. It's, it's making noise over there. Let me go down, please. Please let okay, it okay. Hold on and let me go down. Okay. Hey, and then when I see what I'm Okay. Now the question again, please. <laughs> That the wires were touching oh. outside. That's why they, they were touching oh, okay. each other. You <laughs> Okay. Uh -huh. I was I was talking about the fetal as a special. The fetal uh, as a special. But yes, please. We didn't talk about okay. So when we say the fetal as a special, yes, Fatao, happy bad too. Fatao. What do you understand by the fetal as a special? Oh, Georgina, Georgina. Amengo. Georgina, I yes, let's hear you. Okay. Yeah, Go please. Ahead. You said the fetal as its pressure. pressure. Mm -hmm. We have the amniotic fluid, which serves as shock absorber. Mm -hmm. And this prevents direct pressure of contraction from getting to the fetus. Mm -hmm. When contraction is very intense, the amniotic fluid prevents shock, uh, prevents direct pressure from getting onto the fetus. And this finally prevents fetal hypoxia because if you rupture the membrane and the fluid are out here yeah, and contraction is very strong, you realize that the contraction will be hitting the fetus and that's causing fetal hypoxia if the contraction is very intense. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. I think that explains that. And remember, when we talk about... Yes. The fluid. I thought that one is general as is pressure. The one she explained is the fluid axis pressure. The person asks of the fetal axis pressure. Please, I'm explaining it to you. When we talk okay, about Mahama, yes, Mary Abba. Mary Abba Ando. Stan. Uh -huh. Please, talk about the fetal axis pressure. It's when the uterus rises forward and the force of the pre um, contraction is transmitted to the upper part of the fetus. 
Halloween one. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Yes. Following the axis um, of the fetal, when we talk about the axis, we are talking about the relationship of the longitudinal aspect of the fetus to the uterus, right? So fetal axis pressure, where contractions are coming directly and it's affecting the, uh, that is the spine, let me use the word, the spine of the fetus. While the fetus is lying longitudinally, longitudinally, the pressure that is coming from the fundus is affecting the, ba the baby, passing through the spine of the baby and then affecting the cephalic presentation of the baby. And that is why we say fetal as is pressure. If you want to avoid that, even though it's a physiological something, if you want to prevent it, you try as much as possible to maintain the, uh, uh, the membrane, to retain the membrane, that you don't rupture it. So that even when there's fetal acid pressure, it wouldn't have severe or direct impact on the acid nature of the baby. That is the fetal acid pressure. I don't know. Now, the moment that you write, in fact, it is it has similar explanation to that of the general fluid pressure. But this one is that uh, depending on the line of the fetus, so that if the line is longitudinal. In this particular fetus, then the fetal axis pressure is going to be longitudinally affecting the fetus. If it is transverse, the baby is lying transversely, then it will affect the baby's spine, the entire spine, in a transverse manner. These are the two explanations that I'm giving you with respect to the fetal axis pressure. So I'm saying that the fetal axis pressure, because of its impact, on the axis of the fetus, let's try as much as possible to conserve the membranes without rupturing the membranes in the heart. So that is the explanation I can give you. If somebody has any other explanation to give, please give it. Patao Habibatu, do you have any further explanation? Patao Habibatu, I can see your hand up. No, Hadja. Ah, oh. uh, okay. Yeah, hello, Hadja. Elena, who's okay, go ahead. Hello, Haja. Yeah, if I can hello, understand. yes, yeah, yeah, go go ahead. Uh -huh. so my understanding, I think so the fetal as expression is is as a result of uterine contracts. The uterus, mm -hmm. yeah, the uterus rise forward, and that force of the fanda yeah. contraction is being transmitted to the upper pole of the fetus, down to the long axis of the fetus, and that pressure. And it puts pressure through the presenting part into the service. Hmm? Oh, it's not like well, that. You are, no, it's you were you were on track, like I explained, but it's like you added something to take away the meaning. The later okay. part that you added is taking away the meaning. Okay. Other than that, it's the same thing that I explained. Unless you have other means of explaining it please is anybody having a different explanation to the fetal as this pressure other than that we move on um, yeah yeah please my hand is up yeah um, Go ahead. please i want to add to it that with the fun a uh, fetal as this pressure, pressure it is more significant after membranes has ruptured and during the second stage of labor. That one, you will feel it. Like when the woman contracts, you will see that the presenting part will keep on descending, Adv advancing. coming down. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's just like I said, it will depend on the line of the fetus. Because if it is transverse line, I don't think you even encourage yourself to, or you encourage the woman to push through what? She can't deliver per vaginum. But then if it is longitudinal line, that is where you feel it better. The pressure exerted will just push the baby down and baby can be born through the cave of Karos. As we keep on explaining, further explanations will be added to it. So on this note, let's quickly see the mechanism of labor. Mechanism of labor. Before, or let's manage the first stage of labor before we go to the mechanism. Let's manage, please, with the management of first stage of labor, 
I expect every member of your group to say something. I expect every member of your group to say something. So I want to see more hands with respect to the management of first age of labor. I even gave you an acronym, if you remember. I made you to write down some acronym. Do you remember? Yes, oh, sister. Yes, please. Yes, sister. You can use yes, sister. Ahoy, yes. Me. Ah, oh, is the hoy? Yeah, the hoy, the hoy, me. You can use that to manage the first thing of labor. Those who didn't come for lectures that day, they are wondering what what is the word that they are talking about. They wouldn't know. Okay, so now let's go ahead with the management of first stage of labor. What do you do? Somebody or one person can manage it nicely, and we all listen. As we all listen, you go ahead. Please, somebody should. I'm seeing more hands up. Okay. Somebody has not spoken in this class before. <laughs> Maria Musa Bodhi. Maria Musa Bodhi. Go ahead and manage the first stage of labor for us. You have been managing clients, so this shouldn't be an issue at all. Um, the management of first stage of labor, I want to talk about the admission process. Admission process. With the, can, you, with, can you make sure your voice a little bit? Oh, okay. With the uh -huh. admission procedure, uh -huh. it has to start with establishing rapport. That is mm -hmm. welcoming the client, making the client feel comfortable by introducing yourself, offering them a... Your system. voice is too low. I'm not hearing you well. But you are making sense in a way. Well, just increase your voice a little bit so that we can I, all hear you well. I don't know why there. Okay. Please, can you hear me now, Adia? Now, yeah, can it's clear now. Okay. Yeah, it's okay. With the admission process, it starts with establishing rapport. You start by greeting, introducing yourself. You offer them a seat. You make them comfortable. And the second one is history taking. That's where you take the ANC book, you go through the parity, the age, the um, uh, how do I say? the gestational age, the everything about it, like in the antenatal book. And then you go ahead with the general examination, where you examine her from uh, by palpation, auscultation, and the um, I don't know how to go ahead, the madam. Vagina, like the vaginal examination as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the third one, the fourth one actually is caring for her physiologically and emotional. That's all I can say for now. Thank you very much. Can you thank you so much? Please, can we have somebody continue with the management of first stage of labor? Please just tell us what have you been doing at your facilities so that we add to it if it is not good practice. We try to find ways and means of letting you stop and then replace it with good behavior. So let's manage our client. She's in the first stage of labor. Who is doing it? Anybody who is ready? Yeah, yeah. Zule, yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Please, yeah. Please, yes, to add up to. What she said, mm -hmm. after you create your rapport, you take history because the history. I thought is I was history. the one on the floor. Who is talking? Who was the one on the floor? I just mentioned Yahya. Yes, I mentioned Yahya Zuliha. Now you should continue okay. from where. When the lady said she's done. That is all that she can remember. Okay, I, please I look there, let me continue. Mm. So if you take the history, the history will be able to tell you that whether you can deliver the client for your facility. So if you take the history according to what they will tell you in the ANC card, because some of the women come with some obstetric history that you could not uh, deliver her at your facility for the protocol we are having. So depending on the history you take, you know, 
who actually let you go ahead whether to deliver her at your facility or repair her. And the observation, you look at the abdomen, you check for any scars and any, whether the woman has any bandage strings or any of that thing. So the vaginally will go and assess for the cervical dilatation and the presentation. You also can check the pita head to see whether there is molding or anything. And then based on the observation and the examination you have done, you manage her accordingly. Mm -hmm. If the pain is uh, too severe, you can either give her a sacral massage or you encourage her to ambulate around. And if you, you have done your observation and you realize that uh, the fetus, there is a, either the FH is not good or is faster, depending on how you have done it, you can decide to start with giving the IV to to uh, boost the FH. Sometimes if there is even meconium stain, when you do the V, depending whether the membranes are fractured or not, when you do your V and you come out, you look at what is in your fingers or on the glove. If it's meconium stain, then you can give IV to help the fetus uh, breathe well. And then investigations that you are supposed to do to the woman, being it laboratory, Sometimes uh, the facility is together with the laboratory. So if you check and the AG was low or the AG is not encouraging and the woman is still far, maybe she's 4 cm dilated or 5 or 6, she's not fully dilated. You can actually recheck re the AG because it's very important because if the AG is low and she deliver, you, you can get PP because of the low AG level. And then, depending on uh, the progress of the labor too, will prepare the woman into the second stage. So when you do all this examination or management, we'll be able to tell you whether you prepare, pre you prepare the woman towards uh, the second stage by preparing all what you need and also moving her to the delivery room to conduct your second stage. Thank you. Please, I'm done. You're done, I'm done. <laughs> Thank God, though. Okay. Thanks so much. But I didn't hear you feeding your clients. Please, it is something that I so gave, because I gave IV <laughs> I gave uh, IV food, so uh, yeah. If you're sensitive, the patient when they and... come in the labor, they don't want to eat. Some of no, them, do... but they don't want to talk at all. Uh, so most but, of them uh, we give IV food to hydrate yes, them and then to hydrate them. But if the patients can take something orally, then give something per us for her. Let her take. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh -huh. So that it's not always that you may get the uh, the fluids, IV fluids available, but something that she's sipping, it can be much can any water uh, fluids can be given. It can be squeezed orange or anything that is watery because you can never tell how the labor will end. Like I was telling you, the final presentation with uh, hospital anterior, but it will turn into face presentation or something else. So once you don't know the outcome of that labor, give something fluid that even when it comes to waste, you can just pass, send it to you and then uh, aspirate the contents and prepare for maybe another means of delivery for the woman. So that is it. So feeding is very, very key. Please, to those of you who have been working in the delivery rooms, please, if you don't have anything at all to offer to your clients, at all, you don't have anything. She didn't bring any food. She knew yourself, you're not having anything. Oral rehydration salts, ORS, just prepare ORS and give it to the woman to be sipping, to be sipping. It will rehydrate her very well for you. So that when she reaches a second stage of labor, you wouldn't even need to talk plenty before she will, 
push the baby. So always Hello, have ORS in your cabinet. Yes, yes. Hello, Haja. Yes. Please, uh, to add up, uh, this, you can also give normal water, like uh, clean water. And the labor too, okay. you have to monitor with labor, pathograph. Pathograph, yes. Yeah. Very good. Very good. Thank you. So it can be ordinary water. But normally, because we want to have this electrolytes balance for the woman, that is why we are saying that even if you don't have the IV line, you can go ahead and prepare ORS for her. She'll be so energized that when it gets to the second stage of labor, you wouldn't need to talk plenty before she pushes. It's very important. So that is the management of first stage of labor. Encourage her to be emptying the bladder at frequent intervals so that at least it will help facilitate contraction and then the labor will be shortened for her. Don't let her go into the second stage of labor with a full bladder. Never ever should you do that as a midwife. Okay, so in the course of doing all these things, then let's see the uh, mechanism of labor. Any question on first stage of labor? Any question? Yes, I do. Uh, yes, I'm managing our clients without the baseline cycle. The vital without sign. what? The vital sign. Oh, she and said the observation. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah, the temperature pulse respiration and the BP. Normally, the pulse, the pulse, the monitoring of the fetal heartbeat, and then uh, there's one more thing. Contractions. And timing, contractions. yeah, timing of contraction. Yes, yeah, should be done every 30 minutes. 30 minutes. Every 30 minutes, yes. <laughs> Every 30 minutes, you have to do this. And then the four hourly one, the four hourly one that you do is a checking of the BP vagina examination and then checking of the temperature. These three things you do it four hourly. Every four hours, you do that for the poor woman. Every four hours, you do that. But the 30 minutes one is the timing of contractions, checking the pulse of the mother, and then listening to the fita heartbeats and recording it. Some people carry out procedures, but they don't record it. If you do that, people have, somebody may, may take you on. You didn't, you didn't take good care of my auntie. You didn't take good care of my wife. I'm taking you to the court. I'm doing that and doing that. But if you record it, the record will serve as a legal backing for you so that you can pull the patient's records and say, these are our handwriting. We took good care of your patient. Don't say we have neglected your woman. Recently, there have been some issues going up and down, court cases against midwives and nurses. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but if you do proper recorded, then you can safeguard the situation. So that is it. Don't forget to use cold towel. I mean, cold water, dip it in. Dip the towel in the cold water and there'll be more pain sweat from the patient's face. Mop the sweat. She feels so comfortable. It's so soothing to them. Stand by her if you're not doing much for others. Stand by her. Console her. Reassure her of your preparedness. Your readiness to assist her to have a, a live baby. Reassure her. Give her that, that assurance. And then you'll be fine with you. Okay. So that is it. And then another thing that we have to do is to uh, prepare the delivery trolley towards the second stage of labor. When you have done, you have taken blood sample. Uh, using the, the home that I gave you, you use the eye to investigate. Do investigation, laboratory investigation, by checking the AB, the grouping, the cross matches. Do it and put it down. Because you cannot never foretell what the delivery, uh, the outcome of that delivery process. You can never tell. So do all this to check her hemoglobin, put it down. In case of any emergency, you can just lay hands on and save the woman's life. 
Okay. So that is it. Any question? Yes, Sajia. Yes, please. Go ahead. Um, please, there is this thing that I do. I want to know if it's right or not. So I had an, an experience at offense. So the client lied during her ANC whilst they were taking the history at ANC. She mm -hmm. had experienced PPH to the extent mm -hmm. that they, they transfused her, but then she lied. So mm -hmm. when she came into labor, we just looked at the history in the ANC mm -hmm. book and continue with the management until mm -hmm. after second stage that she started bleeding. We had to even transfuse her with three pints of blood. So mm -hmm. now what I do is when they mm -hmm. come cry, I will intentionally ask that hey, also mm -hmm. just so she would confirm whether it's true or not. I want to know mm -hmm. if is if they can take me on say I'm a child try to almost or something. Oh, no, no, no. It's sometimes people, they themselves, they can be telling lies. In fact, it depends on the relationship, the environment that you have created in, in, in terms of your communication with the clients. She can't take you on because you want the best for her. That's why you want to know. So it depends on the approach, how you approach the clients, that the patient will come out wholeheartedly and tell you what what has had happened to her before. But then if he realizes that you are shouting, you are the, 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 the snobby type of midwife, one to your snobbing patient, that one she cannot trust you. Confidentially, she can't trust you. And that's where the problem will come from. Okay. Hello, Hajia. Please, Hajia. Yes, madam. Please, yes, um, madam. I want to also say something. I want to add up. Um, please, um, as midwives, I want us to um, be curious. The antenatal books that the client brings to our facility, we should try as much as possible mm -hmm. to go through it. I've, um, I've actually encountered yes. a situation whereby the client um, bled and then we had to transfuse. Because we didn't really go through the book and gave the transfusion, she later came to say that she attends and she's from the religion that, that don't take blood. And it became a whole issue. And then she was saying her document was in the book. It means we overlooked it. We didn't really go through the book. So please, you should be very cautious when they bring the book. We should try as much as possible to read very well. Take every paper from the book, open it so that you know everything about the client. Thank you. Thank you very much. That is a nice question. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yes, yes, I want to say something, please. Um, Go ahead. I think that our colleagues at the ANC should be very welcoming because sometimes the attitude you give to the client will allow the client to say everything because mm -hmm. I had an encounter with a client and then she was grabbing at three para two not knowing the first baby was severely associated and then the second baby also died. They didn't state anything like that. But when she came and then she met me with the reception I gave to her, she openly said that. And then I wrote that in her book. So I had to refer her to a gynecologist. So one thing I wanted to say is that when they come and then they meet us, we should be very welcoming to them because that's still they see in our face. Some people will not say what they ha really have behind them. So that's what I want to say. Thank you. Hadia, please question. Hadia. Hello, Hadia. Hadia. Hello. Please question. Uh, yeah, Hello. Josephine, is that Josephine Tente? Yeah, yes, yes, Go please. ahead. Go please, ahead. Mm -hmm. um, in case your client come and you are uh, maybe cheap soon and the person is not a... Uh, going for love, you refer the client to do loves and the person is not doing and then this person comes in labor and maybe the client is in second stage. You have to uh, deliver and then refer her to go and do the love or you uh, refer her, you go with the client to the next level where there will be a laboratory investigation. No, but the patient would deliver on the way. She is likely to deliver in any unhygienic environment. So you conduct the second stage of labor and then go ahead with the lab investigation. In every rule, there's an exception. And 
Who's are made to be working in any way? Because how can uh -huh. a woman be in second stage and you don't want to attend to her, you want her to go to another area to deliver? She will deliver on the way. Please, I was saying that you go with her, like you take your things and you deliver going on the way to uh, the facility. Because I remember I had a case. I referred this lady more than four times and she was saying she was not having money. But later when she came in labor, I wasn't around. So she went to the next uh, health center. She delivered and immediately the way she bled, she mm. died mm -hmm. later, yeah. Hannah will bear me with it. But what saved me was I, I wrote in her AAC book, clients referred to do laboratory investigation and refuse. Clients had been uh, re-counseled and then sent to lab again. That was what saved me from the maternal audit. Like, they would have said I mm. did it because I didn't take uh -huh. very good care of her. Yeah. So mm. the doctors okay. were insisting we should them mm -hmm. to do the lab investigation. Here is the case. Mm -hmm. The clients are come during labor, maybe in first stage. You have to refer the client to go and do labs and come back. Or you refer her to go and do it at the main hospital. Adia, mm -hmm. please, yeah, follow up mm -hmm. on uh, what our sister is saying. Okay. Most of us are working in the in the hard to reach areas of ladies. Yes. Mm -hmm. And all the time we have this kind of complaint oh, that, yeah. that uh, mm -hmm. someone will come uh, for the ANC, you refer them to go to the bigger hospital. Most of mm -hmm. them, some of them, is just that they will not go because they think that because it's a village and she's going to move to a bigger place. Like when she gets there, she doesn't get the reception some of them, there is no money. So let's try mm -hmm. our best, especially those of us working in the villages or chief students. Mm -hmm. When they come, and most of the time, they come in second stage with those problems, either HD, she's post date, she has HIV, or those things, and she comes in second stage, you can't even refer her again. Please, let's deliver them. When we are delivering, and then you start with your IVs, you start to hydrate her because most of them they will bleed. And then you start writing your referral and move with her. So when she comes and she's not even in second stage, she comes 7 cm, 8 cm. Please let's also do our checks, maybe checking the conjunctiva and the little things we can also rule out anemia. And when you are there or you are you can estimate that maybe she's, mm -hmm. she can, she's low in AG or the AG is low. Let's start to give them the IVs. Let's just get the line because when she delivers and she starts bleeding, most of the veins will collapse. So what me I do at my end is when they come without those labs and she's second thing, I quickly get the line and then set my trolley, deliver her, and then call the next uh, referral center and inform them that this is the case I'm having at hand. And I'm coming with the person. Quickly uh, arrange with them either a motorbike or a tricycle. Because most of us here, we are using the tricycle. And then you move it because the BPH is something that is killing most of our women in the kids zones and then health centers. And when they come like that, you can't do anything unless you deliver it. So quickly, when we deliver, let's start to prepare them. And most of us, we have the age sticks at our various ends. If we don't have it, please, sisters, let's get them. When we get to the town, you can buy it and come. So that the age stick, that's one you can quickly do when they are even in second stage. You check it and see. When it is and it's within normal or it's slow, you just start with the IV. And when you deliver her, you should have all our protocol, our oxytocin and our cytotech available. When we deliver them, we will start the management and move them to the next stage. Because some of them actually need transmission. Some will even collapse on their way or even at your facility. So you just need to call for help if there are other staff around and then move to the next stage. Thank you. I'm done.
continue. Hello. 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 Yes. Hello. It's not too well. Hello, please. I can hear you. I can hear okay. you. Elena, I want to add up. I want to add up with the the AG or other things that we need to be done. I also encountered success here at my facility. I was able to speak to that place as a new person. So while I was doing my work with the new facility, she was doing the session. Actually, when I also did my examination assessment, I confirmed that the person was in the second stage. If one never takes her age since the day or two, I explained the procedure to her and the relatives. So I am going to share and do uh, to go and call. She has a pharmacy now, who is also around. So I asked her if she has money so that the person will come and do the age for me. They said they don't have. And I have to conduct the delivery because if I refer to the email, she will deliver on her way. So after the conduction of the delivery, I managed this man, try to finish us to take care of the facility. This man was still delivered. So I have to call the pharmacy man to come and check this patient because this one is delivered. In fact, she bled a lot. Sometimes it's Please, we can't hear what you are saying. No, the light keeps on breaking. It will come clearly at the point in time. You can't hear anything. So whatever it is, I think we have all done well by contributing. Yes. So we need to make sure that there's this uh, involvement of husbands and a close relative that the woman will point at that oh this woman i want her to be part of the proceedings i want her to stand by me or that kind of thing then you go by it that way other than that uh management of first stage is something that if it is well managed that is where the decision will come as to whether the labor will end well or not so let's try to stop the shouting unnecessarily on our patient let's try not to shout at them because it is labor he's in pain it is labor, we call it, and it's a real labor that the woman is living with. And to some of us who have been slapping patient's thighs, huh? you slap the patient's thighs, it's like you are beating the patient. It's not good. We are learning all this. You start abnormal labor and you see that uh, if there's abnormal presentation, there's no way this woman can deliver up her vagina. Why am I worried about her? I mean, beating her. If it if it can accelerate labor, I think that like mouse like Yaya and Bitiria, Ojo and Briggs and all those people, they would have written it in the textbook that if a patient is in labor and she's moving to stop on bitter, the word bit they can spell, they can write. But there's no textbook where you will find that when a patient is in labor and she's struggling to push the baby, the midwife should be there. It is not recorded anywhere. From all that we are learning, you can see that. Nobody would deliberately want to kill the baby that she has, she has carried for nine months. If he wants to kill her, then she should go home and do her own thing. You see? So please, please, let's try to be nice to our client. Let's talk to them for them to feel that they are human beings. The fact that she's coming to ask for services doesn't warrant that she should beg you for health care. No, we shouldn't do that. Some of us are, we are too full of ourselves. Don't if you have midwife, don't be too full of yourself. Calm down, humble yourself. So the patient themselves will bless you. Once the patient will do something, the patient opens her mouth to say, Madam, Yami Shrao. Madam, God bless you. It is enough for God to bless you. But not the type of midwife who have been shouting at patients. Patient is not able to push because her subpubic angle is so acute. Probably it's even less than 60 degrees. You said push and push the baby out. Where is she going to push to? Where? Where will she stand or where will she lie and then they do the pushing? The fault is not hers. 
neither is it your fault. But then you are the professional. So you are there and avail yourself. Let the patient get the feel that somebody is caring so much about me. And it is enough. Mm? So please, I beg you. Normal labor is something very interesting that if you handle it well and manage the patient very well, being so positive to the client, the end reward, you are going to get it. Some of them have been in treatment after doing all these things. To open her mouth, you say, Madam, thank you, cry. She, she wouldn't say it. But that doesn't warrant that you should shout her tail. Your reward is heavily coming and in thousand force. So that is it. On this note, if you don't have much question to ask me, I think it's time. I don't want her, the the ICT man to halt to end the lectures abruptly. <laughs> it's so good. Other than that, I can't even give you reading areas to go and read. So please. Thank you. That is it. Yes, oh, madam. Please, Haja, I wanted to ask, maybe if uh, mm -hmm. a Jehovah Witness lady come to deliver and through the mm -hmm. process, she started bleeding and she needs mm -hmm. a transfusion. And you know that mm -hmm. their rules is against blood transfusion. Should mm -hmm. you allow her to die or you should transfuse her falsely? Mm -hmm. I think uh, this is a big question that... Uh, has been going on in some facilities. I'm a witness to where a midwife dressed up when they were going to do his hysterectomy for a patient whose uterus had ruptured. And the midwife went and told the husband she shouldn't agree because they are, she's a church member. She wouldn't like the woman to receive the blood. She went and gave a theater gun to the patient, to the patient's husband, only for him to enter the theater and then stop the doctor. Please stop cutting my... Uh, don't, don't, you go ahead and remove the uterus, but don't transfuse it. Can you imagine? Can you imagine a whole midwife put up this kind of behavior? Later, later, that midwife wanted to come here and then teach at the university. I said, no, I know you very well. You can do and then uh, make things worse for the students. No, you can't come here and teach. You see, so the evil that men do lives us. A fact that you don't want it doesn't mean that, are you ready to kill? If you leave the woman to die, you are killing. It amounts to killing. So if you if you are not ready to kill, why do you have to leave the woman to to to, uh, to die because she's receiving blood? Let it come from the woman. If she says, yes, I won't take the blood, I want to die, then fine. You document it, let her sign. Let her sign, write a, a letter, let her sign against what you say, madam, you say you don't want the blood. I'm giving it, I'm, I'm telling the doctor, but then I'm, I've documented it. Can you sign, can you turn print 20 cases so that if anything happens to you, I will not be taken on. Nobody can take legal action against me. For you know, it is the husband who is protesting. What about the client's mother and father? They struggle to bring her to that level for you to get her to marry. Now, it, a, a time has come for her to take the blood. You say, no, I won't let you take the blood, you die. Did you come to marry her to encourage her to die? No. So do your part as a midwife. If it comes to where the patient is saying, no, I don't want to please document it. Because documentation serves as a legal backing for every professional. So document it. If the patient dies, you are not the one who killed her. No relative can come and take. For all you know, the patient relatives are not, the parents are even not JW people. They are not. She and the husband attend that church. And the husband cannot decide to kill the woman because she's a, a this is, she's Jehovah. So let's open our eyes and then do proper documentation. That's all that I will tell you. On this note, please, if you don't have much to say, if you don't have additional things to say, Adia, shall we call please, the letters? Yes, madam. Yes, yes, please, yes. Um, concerning, concerning the labs too, we have to um, mm -hmm. be checking the platelet level too. That one also counts. Because if the HB is good enough and then the platelet is low, sometimes the, um, the coagulation factors will not come in. So after um, after delivery, the mother will continue bleeding after the time that maybe the doctor will come in. And then that mm -hmm. So during the AAT, you should be careful about the platelet, the amount of platelet in the FBC lab. Mm -hmm. And then, hello. 
And then Hello, we, should we, prove, we should prove further um, on the enema, if they have had enema before coming in labor, because mm. that one also counts. Because I've had an experience what, where... What, what? Mm -hmm. I've had experience where Who the woman had an enema. Then when she came in the beginning, she mm. was 3 cm dilated. Two hours later, I, the woman said, Madam, the baby is coming. The mother, Madam, the baby, I was there alone too. So I have to call mm. other colleagues there, other nurses to come and help me. Mm. So I asked, I asked her, I, then she said, yes, I had an animal before coming. So mm. when we are taking history, she should, should also okay. ask about animal. Mm. Thank you. Okay. That's Hello. Good. But one thing is that you know, some of you, some of you, when the client tells you that she has given enema, it's true. Some of the drugs contain oxytocic agents, and it will cause precipitate labor. Even without giving the enema, do you know that people can get precipitate labor? Are yes, you aware yes. of that? Yes, I yes. Uh -huh. yes. Sometimes, sometimes she might have taken plain water enema. It's possible. Or she might have taken uh, the concussion that contains oxytocin. And it's accelerating the labor. That one is also there. What do you people do? What some of you behave towards the clients? The way we shout at the patient, they try to, uh, you know, hide certain good information, vital information from you. The way we, let's try to be nice. So from today going, if you know you are the type who are kaire kaire, shouting at patients anyhow, please make sure, make sure that. Oh, yeah. from, this is from that cat, cat, character. Be oh, yeah, nice to the client. Talk them well. Talk to the patient as if you were your sister or your, your mother. Mm -hmm. Please. So that I is how we have to, to handle the this. clients. Oh, yeah, mm -hmm. Please, I wanted to say this. Some of our colleagues at the remote areas, let's say the health centers and all that, some people do induction of labor. And then when they do induction and it fails, when when they are referring, they won't tell you that I did induction because they know they are not supposed to do induction at their various facilities. So when you are at the hospital and this case comes, because she did the induction and it has failed, contraction is very intense. If you are not able to ask the patient or if the patient didn't tell you that, Madam, you did not share my say or not, then you also go on further. The patient did either rapture and die or it will cause a uh, no. less effective... Uh, Okay, um, yes. So please, our sisters at the remote area, you are not supposed to do induction. Even if you have done something like that, when you come, tell your colleague midwife, this is what I've done. So let's continue from here. <laughs> because we are all saving the mother and the baby. Then you do the induction, then you come and put problem on another person at the hospital facility. And then you make the work very tedious for her. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. So you are sharing your experiences. I wanted to add the way you also speak to remote area midwives. It's very bad. Hello. Hello. Hello, Hadia. Be nice. Please, yes, yeah. Yeah. Please to add up to the lab and we want to Amma. Please, if everybody decides to talk, who will listen to the other? Let me call you before you talk, please. Other than that, the whole place becomes noisy. Eh? So let's talk one at a go. The, the, the ICT man may take us off any moment from now. So let's handle the, the pertinent information from your experiences that you are sharing so that we can also, it, it may cause somebody to change her attitude towards patients. Me, attitude not change is what I'm interested in. Your attitude, some of your attitude towards clients is just too bad. Too bad to contribute to maternal death. So let's change. Now that we are doing the degree midwifery, free, let's try to change our behavior. Change the way you talk to the patient. Those sarcastic words coming from your mouth always to patients. They are afraid of you. Let's try to change. We are all Christians. You are all Christians. Some are Muslims. So let's do something that God will be pleased with us. Not that anything that will hurt the patient so much. Patient is crying within her just because of the way the midwife is approaching her. Please, let's be nice to our clients, okay? Now, the one whose hands is up. Hello, hi there. Yes, yes, your uh, name. Ohimakusia, go ahead. Ohimakusia. 
Uh-huh. Please, so uh, I wanted yes. to add to our behavior. I want to experience a midwife delivering a client. As she was coming, she was already in second stage. So the position, when she wanted her to lie down for her, it was in a shouting state. Madam, do this. Madam, do that. So the woman was confused and didn't know what to do. So the four water then burst onto the midwife. And then she even slapped the client before positioning the She would do that. Mm-hmm. She would do that. When she was doing it, ah. it the, the fear and everything, the woman pushed through without controlling herself. And then the baby was paralyzed after. They have this one side paralyzed because of the force pushing that she also went to because she slapped her immediately and then she was also yeah. going to herself. Yeah, and then the baby was paralyzed because she she exerted she the anger on the baby. Yes, she's she 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 the anger on the baby. Yes. And sometimes oh my goodness. The, the, give us. the laboratory investigation. Please, Santa, let's take our time. We should see some of the doctors or the laboratory. They can explain things to us. We should know what it entails. We shouldn't be only concerned with the HB. The HB is only the hemoglobin level that is there. There are other, uh, other things that come to play to make the whole blood, uh, the, the full, uh, full blood count complete. Please, let's take our time and learn how to interpret this thing one after the other. So that Good. we can yep, interpret all these things. And then the scan too. Please, we shouldn't be much concerned about the UDD, the gestational age. Please, there are other things that come to play. And then when we are filling the antenental book, we should take our time and fill it. Some people will just fill the clients and leave the rest. Everything mm. contained in the book is needed. And it is part of what you are going to manage so the woman comes out with the baby at the end. Mm. So please, whatever information is in the antenatal book, write it. Let it be. We done. have to uh, attend okay. to it. Have Good. Great. Very Thank important you. information that Ohima Kosia has added. Please. And I think uh, others also have something to add. Uh, it's yes, very important. Me, my concern is that if you manage a client well during the first stage of labor, even if complications will set in at all, it wouldn't be something that is beyond your control. No. It wouldn't be something that would be beyond your control because if it is information that you are soliciting from the patient, because of the way you are going about it nicely, in a very nice, calm manner, a calm tone, your voice is so gentle. Why would she like to lie to you? Why would she hide this kind of things if she has done that? Why would she lie to you? She wouldn't do that because she knows that her life is also at danger. Uh, she saw, her life is also at risk and so she wouldn't lie to add to any midwife. But your approach, I keep on hammering on that. Your approach is just too bad. Let's try to be nice to the client so that when we are going home and you are closing from work and the patient Jen hasn't delivered. You see that she will say, Madam, won't turn in chair. Madam, won't you like to wait for me to deliver? Please let me deliver before you go. You see, she'll be pleading with you. You see? But if you are the type who shouts back, who insults patient, you slap patient. Which of the textbook is talking about slapping patient when she's not able to push? Is it Margaret Miles? Is it Sylvia Veras or what? None of the textbooks is talking about slapping a woman when she's in labor and she's not able to. To, to push. Have you forgotten that you didn't feed the client? You didn't feed the client. The, hungry, the client is hungry. There's no energy for her to push, yet you are beating her and forcing her to push. On this note, may God forgive us our iniquities. May God forgive us the wrong things that we are doing. May the Almighty Allah forgive us and teach us the right path, the right thing. Have the fear of God in you when you are conducting the Amen. 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 Yes. Amen. Have the fear in you. Yes. So that patient will be happy with you, madam. Yes, Jemima. Yes, Jemima. Yes, Jemima. Go ahead. Mama, it's very Jemima. Hello. This is Hadia. My hand was a long oh, time ago. Okay. Take us off uh, any moment Adia, from please, now. So. Uh, in, oh, in, yeah. in regards to uh-huh. managing our client, in managing uh-huh. our client, Ma, please, uh, I had an encounter with clients when she came to deliver. We, I checked the BP and everything was shooting like that. So she was restless and I asked her, Mommy, please, what is wrong with you? 
she didn't want to talk. So I, I tried to force her to talk. I said, please, you confide in me and tell me whatever is bothering you. Mm-hmm. This woman told me that the woman who came to accompany her to deliver, like she had a fight with mm-hmm. her and in three we say, what you do? And see, she was scared that if she delivers, she's going to die. That's what the woman said. Ma, please, is it right to call the person at the facility to beg the person to reverse the case? No, it's like the, the, discourage her from conceiving that idea. Discourage her, tell her that a 